Yes, yes. I need to work on the last one. Okay, this is metal working one on two. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this I thought this was invertebrate sexuality. <laughs> no, that's after eleven. We got an ID for that threat. <laughs> That's what we drink while we talk about it. Yeah. Well, stuff. All right, this is the uh, 102, Sing Punk 102, so you want to be an airship officer slash, slash captain, run like hell. Man. Run very, very far. What the, were you thinking? Yeah. Uh, no, this is the 102 panel. Um, I think I recognize most everybody's faces, either from the panel earlier or talking to us on stars and stuff, or showing up at my house and never leaving. Um, <laughs> um, or if I get you to do our desk. Yeah, our turn. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we start this, out? do not listen to this man and or my navigator, my wife, there is not going to be an ASI male bullet show. Okay. <laughs> this in a course. I know. <laughs> Actually, you can say that all you want, but there's a lot of people that would beg to differ. <laughs> Dude, if they pushed on doing the 1950s feather dance, butt naked. <laughs> what should I do? I'll take pictures and videotape. I now for it's after 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I've got way too much sleep deprivation for that comment. Wow, um, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I need to sleep. Yeah. Um, yeah. How many hours weird. and how many hours? Yeah. Anyway, for those of you guys that don't know who we are or who I am or who that weirdo is, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I'm Captain Cedric Wager, Captain of the Airship Isabella. This is Captain Delacruz, Captain of my uh, sister ship, the New Dulcimer. Um, Godric, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Captain Godric Van Halfen of the Airship Edelweiss. I'm not allowed to say it because I publicly made fun of him. I just want to walk it on the internet. I put it on the internet so it's it got to be true. Uh, this is the 102 panel. Um, we decided to come up with this panel um, after a lot of people came to us and watched and hung around ASI, saw us at conventions and saw how the ASI crew operates as an artist collective, how we operate as an artist team. Um, and being, and then having a lot of airships start to develop after we had started doing the, the concert and all that, I was noticing I was getting a lot of emails from captains and crews you know, asking, hey Cap, I've got this problem, what do you guys do? I've got this problem, what do you guys do? I've got this problem, what do you guys The one thing that, that helped us out a lot is being a former firefighter, I had command school, and being a former army, I had command school, so I was able to take a lot of that information and transfer it into what we did with the Isabel. Um, anybody who's worked in any more than a group of one artist, knows how difficult having a group of artists in the same general area working on projects, God forbid, the same project, can be. Um, yes, no, 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 am I going on a tangent again? They're funny. Um, so this is what we wanted to, to put the 102 panel together so we can come up here and give you guys some of the insight, some of the pitfalls that we've run into over the past two years traveling around the country, doing this full time. Um, so you guys don't fall into the same pitfalls that we've seen other crews fall into, that we've fallen into. Um, the nice thing about, well, let's, let's say this right off the bat, it doesn't matter if you call it an airship crew, if you call it a cosplay crew, whatever it is, it's still people interacting with each other and it's still artistic people interacting with each other. <laughs> I see all the cosplayers back here doing the yes. <laughs> um, so you can transfer a lot of what we've learned and come across into other aspects of the convention world and what we call road dogging. Um, first thing I'll tell you straight off the bat, if you're gonna road dog with the crew, you can ask these guys. We said how we had a meeting before we got hardcore into the convention circuit. Back when I was younger, I was a roadie for a couple bands and a drummer. And I said, look, you guys are about to go on the road. If there is anything you never wanted to know about the people you're gonna road dog with, 
you're going to find out about it on the road. I spend more time with my crew than I do with my, my, most of my family. Luckily, my family actually rolls, my wife and our kids roll to conventions with us. But I spend more time with these guys and know more of their deep, dark, dirty secrets than I ever knew one. We love you, Captain. I wash my clothes right here. Yeah. <laughs> we won't talk about where that mole's at. Um, <laughs> Um, but no, you do you get to a point like being in a band. You guys are going to conventions, especially conventions when you've got either a cosplayer, you've got a panel, or you've got to be here. You've got 10 minutes to do it. There's one shower, and you've got 15 people who have got to get into their gear and get downstairs. Modesty goes right out the window. Because um, you don't have time. Um, uh, <laughs> The other thing that, that we have noticed, I've noticed, and it's one of the, if you guys take anything away from this panel, and this is an interactive panel, this is kind of like talking with the crew, so don't just sit there and give me crickets. <laughs> or a community. Um, I'm just stupid enough to sit up here. Uh, communication, 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 communication. Communication. Okay? Communication. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uber important. It's probably the number one thing. If you want to keep your airship together, you guys want to keep your, your, your cosplay crew together. I don't care how small the problem is. If it got under your skin, get it dealt with. Because what will happen, that one little item that you didn't think was a big deal, you rubbed her the wrong way and she might not have not liked that. <laughs> she might not have said anything. But it's still there. So six months down the line, you guys are you know running your sixth convention in as many weekends. You're tired. You're hungry. You want to do eat something other than McDonald's, Burger King, or Jack in the Box. <laughs> um, you're tired of sleeping in hotel rooms. All it's going to take is that one little thing. You left your razor on the the counter. And now, instead of the crew going down and dealing and completing the mission that they need to complete, now you've got this tension and turmoil going on inside the crew. And it will spread, and it will grow, and you will end up losing friends over it. Um, these guys can tell you I've lost lifelong best friends out of the original ASI, the very first original ASI crew, because of stuff like that. Um, it's hard. It's really hard when you guys are building something to do cons because you enjoy this. You enjoy the community, you enjoy your friends, the people we have sitting in this room together. This is our family. We get to see you guys at conventions every couple weeks, every couple months. That's what we work so hard to do is to come here and show off our ooh shiny new clothes and hang out with all our cool friends. You don't want to be losing friends because you're wanting to do your hobby and not communicating will do it. Um, Hey, I took a shower this morning. What do you wear a gas mask? It's not for you, it's me. Uh, um, oh, we smell you, this guy. Uh, shut down. Oh, uh, did we just talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> Go off on Star Wars, can you? Um, Agent Smith doesn't like the smell. From the captain's point of view, call it captain, call it you know, head of your cosplay crew, whatever you want to call it. We're going to go from captain because that's what I'm used to. And yes, when I'm this tired, I talk with my hands a lot, so just do it. Um, as a captain, it is your number one responsibility to take care of that crew. Period. End of story. At the, at the end of the day, no matter what happens, that crew is your responsibility. If they don't get fed, if they don't sleep, if they don't make the panel when they're supposed to make the panel, if they don't make a costume call for the cosplay that you guys are getting ready to compete in, it's your responsibility, period, in the story. Ask these guys, my crew eats first. I have gone days without eating and will refuse to eat, like right now, until my crew eats. They eat first. If there's no food left, well, well they get to do a beauty and grumpy. Um, but my crew eats first. My crew sleeps first. My crew gets taken care of, because in order for me to complete my mission, 
which is to come bring steampunk to you guys and bring all the ooze shinies and the cool stuff and bring panels to you guys and talk to you guys, my crew has to complete their mission. If they can't complete their mission, I can't complete my mission. So, your crew is your responsibility. If you guys decide to do conventions semi full time, okay, or full time, um, <laughs> get meds first. <laughs> Lots of them. Yeah. If I'm not doing my job in dealing with the con directors and dealing with the people that I need to deal with, my crew can't complete, complete their mission and we don't get invited back to conventions which means we don't get to come see all smiling, happy, non-talking, non-laughing joke at my joke face. <laughs> um, and so it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship as a captain. On top of that, the flip side of that coin, if you guys are my crew and you decide that, you know what, we've been going for six weeks straight, we're going to go get us a bottle of alcohol and go swing from the rafters out over, you know, con ops and tell the con director what we think about him, guess who's going to hear about it? Guess who's getting called into the con ops to the office to listen to the con director who's now got the little vein on the corner of his head bulging and is telling you where you're going to take your contract because it's not going to be here anymore. You're taking the, the, the rear end shoeing for what you're that's, that's my job. My job, my crew screws up, I'm the one that takes it. My deal is, is if they do something wrong, come tell me. If they do something right, go tell them. Everybody, I'm sure everybody here has seen our Facebook presence, has seen ASI and all the things we do. It's not about Whitaker. I'm not ASI. That crew is ASI. I'm just a dummy who says, yeah, I got a good idea. And get stuck up front talking to people. These are the guys that kill themselves to do the job and bring ASI to you guys and Steampunk to you guys and to do all the miraculous, really cool stuff that ASI and the adults are going to do together. It's not me. I just happen to be the figurehead out front that gets to stand there and take the new shiny pictures. Those are the guys that work, and as long as you remember that in your cosplay crew, if you guys remember respect, respect, respect as you're working on a scenario, you know, or whatever, the costume contest. You guys remember, first and foremost, when you first get going, you guys are friends. No matter what happens, at the end of the day, if you guys can remember that and stay friends, you guys will have a black, be it cosplay, be it steampunk, be it God, whatever, you'll be able to pull it off as a crew and Falsely, go ahead, falsely. <laughs> um, I've always wanted to say that. Uh, you guys will be able to handle anything that comes at you and remain friends about it and laugh about it. We have, give you guys, give, and we'll have story time with Whitaker here for a minute. Um, Arizona, we went to Wild Wild West Con. Yeah. Um, it was really stressful driving in because for those of you guys who don't know, the United States has pretty much lost control from the Mexican border all the way up to the south border of Tucson, Arizona. It all belongs to the cartels. There's, and I didn't believe until I got there, there's actually signs on the side of the road that says, if you have trouble, do not call the police. We cannot help you. Okay. Um, they're not paying me for this. Um, so there was a lot of stress driving into Tucson, Arizona at midnight. You know, with a caravan of steampunks, you know, it's like, you know, we got cool guns, but they don't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the crew laughed about it and had a good time with it. And you guys will see some of the weirdest. We're going to have to do an after 11 o'clock panel someday just to go into half the stories. Um, <laughs> But when you pull into a gas station, keeping in mind that all gas stations in this part of Arizona close an hour before sunset. I mean, the, the metal door slams shut. It looks like zombie apocalypse is about to happen. You're whipping out, you know, your fallout gear and getting ready, you know, to start throwing cap grenades at people. And we go to get out of the car, and there are six guys fueling up their vehicle, shaved heads, all in black, cloaks. <laughs> and my commanding officer, those of you who met her, Anne Morant Moreau, wakes up from the back of the night and goes, Oh, look, cultist. 
<laughs> About the point I'm getting out of the driver's seat, turn around, bald head, black shirt, black vest, black pants, black boots, and they went, brother! <laughs> <laughs> What do you want me to believe in this week? <laughs> I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Guys, get in the car. <laughs> but those are the kind of things with running as a crew that you'll run into. We rocking around Houston at 1 o'clock in the morning trying to find non-existent McDonald's that the GPS swears are there. <laughs> And I'm in a town that I've grown up in, and I'm standing on the spot, and it's supposed to be McDonald's, right here. <laughs> Come to find out it's two stories underground and closed at five. <laughs> Man, room service in these places? Whew! Thirty-three dollars for a piece of chicken that big. <laughs> and I was willing to pay. Because um, we walk around downtown Houston, with, I'm sure you guys have seen my crew. That's probably why we didn't get mugged. Um, <laughs> most of the girls in high heels um, and walked around downtown Houston for two hours. Never once did the crew complain. Never once did they complain that they, their feet hurt, that the flask <coughs> could run dry, which they had. Um, <laughs> which would make this a lot more fun trip. Uh, <laughs> But the crew never complained. The crew cracked jokes. The crew turned it into an adventure. Oh my God, we're all going to die. <laughs> uh, guys, I've grown up here, and that's the fifth ward on that block, and we really don't need to be there. We passed Adrian Brody's nose. A bunch. Um, to the point of you have you get so close with your crew and the people you're with, um, we. Raise a hand to the guys, and I might know some of you have, who have met my first officer, Rick K. Big, tall, really tall guy, talks like Barry White, <laughs> with a very, very madly black man voice, but he's the whitest guy you've ever met in your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, downtown Houston, 1.30 in the morning, Houston cops on the corner, sitting in his car doing his paperwork, all steampunked out, and I don't know why, but we started, one of us. <laughs> Okay, the little hand, the hand hug, yes. These three, hand hug, he would not do it to save his life. So of course we all turned on him and one, uh, one. And we're hand hugging and he's screaming and curling up. And we're like zombie apocalypse on him. The cop is losing it. He stopped, he's just like. And he rolls his window down and he's just like. <laughs> he never said one one to us. He just you could see it to me and then he just drove off. Like I'm not <laughs> But as a crew, when you guys do the concert, that that's the kind of stuff that you guys will, will will experience together. And those are the memories that you will take with you for the rest of your life. Um, as long as you work together, you communicate together, you guys can do anything. Okay, I have seen some of the most amazing people, most of you guys are sitting in this room right now, just from being at this con. Okay, walking around not caring about what people think about you, you're here with your family. Okay, to me, that's magic. You guys can take over the world. Okay, and I'm all about Preach the World Unite. Um, <laughs> But it's a communication thing. On our, on our crew, we live by three words. And if you don't, I'll beat you with a pistol. <laughs> Honor, loyalty, respect. They're, they're written in leather on my arm. Okay? Um, Honor, loyalty, respect. If you guys carry those three words into your crew, especially as a leader, okay, you won't do no wrong. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make a fool out of yourself. You're going to make a fool out of yourself in front of God and everybody sitting out there in that con. But you'll be able to laugh about it with your crew and we're not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> or are we? Or are we? <laughs> Ooh, that was a bad idea. What are we doing again? <laughs> um, honor, loyalty, respect. Um, working with a artist collective will be one of the most hardest challenging, nerve-wracking, homicidal, 
what the mm, were you smoking before you walked in my shop? <laughs> and it would be the most rewarding thing you guys have ever done. In the steampunk community, we noticed when we first got into steampunk that Group A didn't want to play with Group B because Group C didn't wear the same shade of brown they did. <laughs> and, oh my god, you've got bone on your hat or you're wearing black after spring or whatever. They didn't want to play with each other. We're like, okay guys, wrong answer. You're going to play nice. No, I said you're going to play nice. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> and I've seen that kind of in the cosplay world too. And a lot of us are co play our cosplayers. We do, you know, different cosplay and stuff. There's no reason for it. The beautiful thing, and those of you sat in our one-on-one -on -one panel, we talked about it a little bit, is once you get rid of that ego, once you get rid of the, you know what? I don't care if you build one of these. Here, this is how you make it. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. This is gonna hurt a lot, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> see the scar? Um, and then you guys come back. We see it, it makes us better artists because now I'm like, whoa, oh, that is so cool. <laughs> oh, I got an idea on that. And off we go back into the shop. And then, like we said, it starts this cold war of artistic expression, be it steampunk, be it cosplay, you know. Um, I'm dying to do a cosplay from Howl's Moving Castle. Oh my god. Okay. Now if I can figure out how to get the castle into the hotel. <laughs> Dave and I are working on that. Give us a little bit of time. Um, I tried the whole fire thing they yelled at me. <laughs> no, what if you go tell them? <laughs> That's a different subject. <laughs> oh, yes. Mantra, mantra and steampunk number two. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> That's the, the flamethrower story. Find the Valkyrie flying underneath of the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alright, real quick segue into a story real fast. I'm driving the story time with Captain Wager and Delacruz. Um, on sleep deprivation. Um, <laughs> We have a friend of ours out of Boston, uh, Ben Hamby, captain of the Sky Dog, built this gorgeous, beautiful wrist-mounted flamethrower, okay? And yes, it's live, and yes, it's working. Oh my God, is it cool. Um, and it will shoot a 30-foot ball of flame across this room. I walked on for my man over here. Ah, yeah, you know. <laughs> so he was at a convention, and I love hearing him tell this story because it's Brings tears my thighs, every time I hear it. Went out to the parking lot to show off said, ooh, shiny piece of steampunkery beauty that he had built. And he's out there and he's shooting off fireballs and ooh, he's cool and blah, 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 blah. About that time, con security comes walking up and says, uh, you guys gotta stop that. Okay. Then con security, who happened to be off duty police department, said, we need to talk to you for a second. And they weren't in the state of Texas. They were in Oklahoma. And the officer said, so, where are you guys from? And he said, we're from Austin, Texas. And he said, so what you're telling me is you transported that flamethrower across state lines? At about that point, Ben grabs the cartridge, chunks it as hard as he can into the bushes, and said, no, that's not what I'm telling you. This is an oversized wristwatch. <laughs> Because since he transported it across state lines and it was built the way it was, it was a weapons of mass destruction and he was looking at federal defense for transporting a weapon of mass destruction across state lines. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so that was a segue I went on tangent. Um, that's the moment. Um, Communication. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm joking about not sleeping. We that's, that's, a good, that's a good segue into uh, you're going to face, and I won't go into details, but you will face clashes, issues, problems, you name Because not everybody works well with everybody. Now, there's different levels, obviously, because there's different people. Um, and situations can get rectified. 
but it all comes down to who's, who's involved. Bottom line is, by all means, remember at the end of the day what he said. Guys, you're friends. You do this for fun. People start taking it really seriously because it, it can get serious because you're dealing with logistics. Even if you're doing it just for fun. Hey, we're going to Acon. Hey, we're going to, to RealmsCon. Hey, we're going to da, 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 da. Even for this con, there's a lot of organization involved in getting a group of people to go synchronize and, and go and do a group costuming thing and whatnot. It can get pretty tedious and people can growl at each other. We do it all the time. Yeah, we do. But thing is, always remember that there are people just like you, they're gonna have reactions just like you and not you're not gonna agree with everyone all the time. You find middle ground and as a captain, you have to kind of act as mediator more often than you'd like. Blunt honesty. You have to you have to keep people from eating each other's heads off. There's a lot of nutrition in that. Especially um, there, Yeah, there's a lot of damage control. He can tell you anybody who's been a, a captain can tell you it's not easy, but it is very rewarding to see the ideas come together that people have and synchronicity and the chemistry that a group of people can have and see that friendship grow. Um, but when it does come down to damage control and you're acting as mediator, you have to be neutral. You have to be completely neutral. No matter how much you agree with one person, you have to be neutral. Because the second you start siding with somebody, it's, it's push in their favor whether they're right or wrong. And that gives an unfair advantage to someone. They might be wrong, they might be right, it doesn't matter. You have to hear both sides out. Um, but that aside, when you do have people working together, oh my God, <laughs> the ideas that come together. Um, we, we recommend, because we, and we don't recommend anything that we don't do. Uh, I recommend y'all go and jump off the post because we do it. No. We have weekly meetings. We highly recommend it. It keeps people, you know, on task with what's going on and, and keeps everybody in the know. It helps alleviate problems if there's problems that come up. It, it brings it up out in the open and it keeps everybody, it's kind of a nice round table thing where everybody has, you know, a chance to say something and it, it becomes work to have fun, for lack of better terminology. But uh, as far as meetings go, that's a, that in and of itself is a whole thing. We've broken out to where uh, we started doing with scars. We've had people doing all kinds of media stuff with like videos and audio and pictures. So you have your artists and then you have your, your builders that do props and stuff and you have to break it down but it can get pretty tedious. Um, it all depends on what level y'all are willing to go. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the biggest thing is one thing that hung. Sleep dead. Oh yeah, the shadow is running down the wall. Are really cool. Yeah, um, I've been. I'm, that's why I've been doing this. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Having flashbacks to these. Uh, <laughs> the biggest deal is no clicks. No clicks. No clicks. No clicks. Clicks will destroy the group in a heartbeat. No matter what it is, it will destroy it. Will rip it in half. You guys might as well get it up before you guys don't talk to each other anymore. Um, uh, can you come talk to, talk to my business thing and make love at the end of the UTSA? They're very close. Cool. That, that will kill that in a heartbeat. The second that you start forming allies into these little groups and it's us and them, it's over. You might as well pop smoke at that point and go, guys, I'm going to form my own crew. Peace out. It's been nice to meet you. Um, as a captain, you know, my fellow captains that I know that are in the room with me right now will tell you, and I told them this when they asked my advice, the second you start to see a click starting to form, kill them. You bring all the parties together, you sit them down and go, all right, boys and girls, we're going to talk, we're going to put on our big boy pants, we're not in high school anymore, most of us, 
and we're going to talk this out and get it out. I don't care if you scream, I don't care if you yell in our shop, I don't care if you bleed. Just don't kill them because then I got to pay for it. Okay? Then I got to find a replacement. Nobody likes It's not easy being a cat. We, we joke on, on Isabella, and it's true. When I say, if I look at you and say, I'm going to promote you, there's a reason my crew runs screaming down the hall going, uh-uh. <laughs> that is not a good thing if I threaten you with a promotion. Okay? Being a captain, as my fellow captain the Constantine said, it, it's gut-wrenching. It truly, truly is gut-wrenching to have to sit there and tell your best friend, I love you, Chica, but you're wrong. Or sitting there going, you know what? You're my friend. I can't get in the middle of this. I've got to stay out here and make sure you two don't kill each other, but you two need to talk. It's, it, it's gut-wrenching. And then having to go to somebody in your crew that is your friend and say, you know what? The rest of the crew, everything's working right, but you're sitting here throwing these monkey wrenches and how the crew's working. We got to talk. Those it's, are some of the hardest conversations. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's I mean, why I went off on that whole tangent. Yeah. Is, you guys, you're friends. Yeah. Bottom line, and and it's I. Oh, he, you can know, you ask him. We hate bringing it up, but it's it's happened in every crew. It's happened in ours. It is you hate to see people go for stupid things. I mean, it, one little thing, and, and problems can be escalated by any party, and it can just get worse and worse and worse. And it's especially hard when it's something that you know you can't control, but you're trying everything in your power. It's like, what is going on? But and you got to remind people when you're here that you're friends. And as a captain, you were, or a leader, and I say captain, guys, so you're not in an airship crew. I apologize, that's just what I'm using, my terminology I'm used to working with. Um, as a captain, you will second guess every decision you make. How does your crew approach you if they have a problem with something that you've done or said? How do you encourage them to come to you with that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Way to volunteer. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, well, my crew members, you know, normally we talk a lot. Three of the crew members are actually sisters. So that makes for a fun dynamic. Because <laughs> they get to, you know, the family squabbles, which kind of plays out into everything else. But for the most part, like everything they just said, we communicate, we keep our respect about each other, and part of uh, working out problems is actually having the respect to say, hey, you know, you know, I love you, you know, I care about you, but I, I can't agree with this, or I have a problem with this, or, you know, is there something we can do about this? You know, you don't just come up to them and say, you're stupid, I hate you for that, <coughs> because that's gonna get you either a boot off your ship, out of the group, or people just hating you, and that automatically forms clicks, which again, as they were just saying, kills a group instantly. Um, it comes back to respect, um, just being able to say, hey, you know, I understand what you're getting at, or, or maybe, you know, could you explain this better to me? Uh, I, I've had a couple times where they, uh, you know, we were talking about how we wanted to do something for a con, and they were like, wait, wait, why do we want to do that? You know, that doesn't make any damn sense. Well, you know, it does if you kind of look at it like this. You have to break it down into A, B, C, D. Okay, well, we didn't look at it that way. It makes sense now. You know, you just have to actually have the respect to say, I don't agree with that, but at the same time, I'm not going to bite your head off about it. It's communication. Yeah. With my crew, if, if the crew has a hardcore issue, if it's an individual, they'll usually come and talk to you. And I've made it plainly known. It's like, look, I am way too old to play this. I didn't. I don't do anything wrong. I'm not responsible for anything. If I screw up, come talk to me, and I'll either apologize for it, tell you why I did it, or some you know deal with both. And if it's something dealing with operations, my first officer will bring it to me. Um, now, when we have our crew meetings, 
we do operate as I tell my crew, hey, this is what we got going on, we get feedback, blah, blah, because we're not a military unit. We're not a paramilitary unit. When we're on the con floor, when we're out here in this world, this is a military unit. My commands go from me to my first officer on down to the rest of my crew, and we have that operational organization is how we get our jobs done. They got a problem with something I've done. When we're on the con floor, I don't care until we get back home. Okay, now that leads a segue into something else. First officers, first officers, first officers. You want to talk about a hard job? Oh my. Because not only do they get it from the top down, they get it from the bottom up. And I'll let you guys take room that any way you want. Because they do. Because they do. Yeah, they connect a circuit. To give, you, to give you an example, we have done conventions where I had, and I'm sure anybody in here who's been in the group knows the whole, whole boyfriend, girlfriend, and the same group thing. Oh, and they start fighting and squabbling, and it goes, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, lovely days. Oh yeah, I never heard the word about it. Period. I did not find out that there was a problem at the con with said boyfriend A and said boyfriend or girlfriend B. Uh, which it might never. I never knew about it until we got back home and Amelia, my wife, said, "Yeah, blah 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 blah." And I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute, back here, ship up, what?" <laughs> When did this happen? Is this the same con? <laughs> My first officer did his job. It was brought to him. He dealt with it. And it never made it up to me because they knew I was dealing with con directors and doing panels and all of this. They dealt with it. Because while we're in here talking to you nice guys, we got air conditioners and we're giggling and answering questions. Um, <laughs> The rest of my crew, our crew, is sitting in the dealer's room dealing with the whores that are rolling in at this convention. Loving every second of it, but they're working constantly. They're We're, really nice. I've gone to talk to them three times. You don't, you don't know them very well. Give it until Sunday. Yeah, they're about the scurvy dog air pirates. Uh, but I love every one of them. Um, no, they are really, and they will talk to you off. They will sit there and bend over back to anybody and everybody and talk to you. Um, but a first officer's job is to be that buffer between the crew and between the command. Because when you really truly get, if you truly play in this world and you want an airship with your know, captain, first officer, blah, 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 blah. You've got the, that military way of doing it, that paramilitary fire department way of do, doing things works for a reason. That's why the military does it, because it works. Otherwise, we would never be, and trust me, you guys want to know what it's like to be a part of ASI crew? Come join the, the ground crew. You can come hang out in my shop and help me load out to come to an event. And you will look at me when we get here going, you're out of your fracking mind. Um, because there's a logistics, packing merch, packing gear, work. Because not everybody on my crew is, is a full-time ASI employee, so they've got their logistics they're worried about. Plus, gas, housing, food, all of that goes into it. And if I drop the ball anywhere, my crew shows up in, you know, Tucson, Arizona, we don't have a place to sleep. We don't have any food for my crew. Now you got real problems. Okay, now, now you drop the ball as a commander, you know, or take it even farther, crew member A, and I keep picking on you guys, crew member A is sitting over here. She's causing all kinds of crap in the crew. Okay, I want to know, okay, why are those three right there on my crew combat and effective? They had a panel to do at 1,800 hours, even in military mode. At 1,800 hours, why did they not complete their mission, first officer? And those of you know, I don't know, you know, <laughs> wrong answer. I want to know why, what is wrong with that dynamic? What can I do to fix this to make this work? Hardcore cosplayers in the room. You guys have a costume contest. You have to be up on stage at 5 o'clock. You guys have been working for months. 
to get ready to do your cosplay. Somebody left their costume back in Houston and you're in Dallas. Problem! <laughs> I hope you guys are fast and so you that. You got some friends who will fit and come in the same costume or come talk to us and look out what you got. Um, <laughs> we got doubles. Yeah. I can put you in a top hat, got <laughs> And maybe a gun. If you hold it right, people won't see that. Um, but that's not that the much logistics much. that go into it and the stress stressor factors that that causes. Um, guys, questions, please, comments. Give me a question. Yes. Do you ever worry with how steampunk is booming in the past few years? Do you ever worry that there's going to be an oversaturation of different crews around that it might actually cut into some of your cons? <laughs> this, okay, personally, that's Valhalla. I would like to see nothing but goggles and top hats. <laughs> That was Aether. Uh, come to the dark side, we have codes. Uh, that ranks that ranks more with the question that we were asking in an interview earlier this week of and it, it kind of took me back a little bit because they're like, okay, in the steampunk world, steampunk is going mainstream. If steampunk goes mainstream, do you consider it selling out by going mainstream? Are you still punk? I was like, whoa. <laughs> I remember when Green Day answered this question. <laughs> and I really liked his answer. Um, no, I'd love to see it go mainstream. One, it, it brings the magic and the beauty that I see sitting here to the rest of the world. And yeah, some of the rest of the world ain't gonna take it. We can sit back and go, we made it work, what's your problem? <laughs> you know, we can all get along and hang out and have a good time and not try and kill each other much unless that's really what we're into. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm gonna have to work with you guys. I'm gonna like bald. Is it gun time yet, Captain? See why my hair is blue. Yeah. <laughs> but it gives us a chance as a, as a community to show the world the magic and the, art, the artistic ability that is in this community. And that magic that we see, I see it. Okay, give you guys another segue story real quick and to give you an insight into why we do this, why I'm putting myself up here in front of you guys, who I most, I care about what every single one of you thinks of us. Okay, so the crickets really make me nervous. <laughs> we went to a convention in Louisiana. I think anybody who sat in my panels has heard this story and knows Cannon and his family. Okay? Quit essential, you can drink when we get back to the table. They made it a game. Every time I say quit essential, you have to take a drink of something. Run with it. Um, quit essential con family. Two teenage girls, gas taken to the con. Oh my God, please go in the dealer's room. Buy what you're going to buy. Hurry the hell up. These people are freaks. I want out of here. I'm going to take my pictures and I'm going to go home. Tilly came across the ASI table. And we're sitting there in top hats and our best tooling on working on leather. And he walked on leather. We sat there and talked and talked and talked. Because of what he, and not because of us, but because of the steampunk world, I get an email two weeks later telling me, me and the crew, thank you. I was like, for what? He's like, I want to thank you for showing us steampunk. But because of what you guys told us, I have now bonded with my 14-year-old daughters. They now have a family airship and they go to conventions together where before he had no communication really with his teenage daughter. I got teenage daughters. Their heads spin around and pea soup comes out the door. <laughs> they know. That's the other half of their parental units right over here. Okay? Our kids is crazy. But it gave that line of communication through the steampunk genre for them to come together as a family. 
I don't care who the hell you are. That's magical. That's because of the stuff you guys do. Because don't think for half a second, when we go to Louisiana, we're not talking about you guys, just like we talk about the Louisiana crew with you. We talk about y'all over there, okay? That's magic. The, you know, I was having a conversation with a girl out in the smoking section. She walked up and she's like, Captain Whitaker, I want to tell you thank you for what you said in the one-on-one now. I said, what, the bad jokes? She's like, no, I didn't have a group to fit into until I found Steampunk. You guys have no clue what that does to us when we hear that from y'all. When I get emails from kids going, I, we have it. Both of us have the emails, and I will never get rid of it. It says, I was on the verge of committing suicide until I found Steampunk, and it gave me a group to, to be in and to grow in, and I found my people. That's why we do this. That's why you put up with the 27 hour days. That's why we road dog 4,000 miles on public transit from here to New Jersey. If you ever want to lose all faith and hope in mankind, get on a Greyhound bus. <laughs> I'll tell you guys those stories after like a clock. Uh, the drug dealer with the menu. <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> This was in Alabama. <laughs> I even asked them if I can get fries and you know a malt with an order. He can only give you a shake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I looked. And I said, dude, if you just have one of everything on that list, you're looking at like you know three thousand years federal time. He's like, eh. <laughs> he's not gonna get on my bus. Uh, but that's the magic that we see in this group. That's why that makes everything worth it. That's why we keep doing these panels. Because if I can reach one kid, if I can reach one outcast freak that comes up and says, you know what? I found Steampunk. I wear purple Raver Falls and I walk in the middle of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud of who and what I am and I found my people. Guys, I will march to the end of the earth for anybody in this room. Because that's magic. I've seen what this what this group and this community can do. And yeah, I get on my soapbox and I rant and rave and all that. But when you see that magic, when you see ships like the Constantine and the Edelvoss, and they come together and become a crew, and you see them interact, hell, Dave and I sit back on Scars tonight. For those of you who don't know about the whole Scars order fight, you're going to find out about it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be able to miss it. Yeah, I can tell you. Uh, sitting back watching, and for us, I know it's not the same as cosplay. It's, you know, live action role play kind of stuff. And we mistakenly call it cosplay because that's what we used to say. But watching these characters develop, and the captain of the Constantine throwing up information, the captain of the boss throwing up information, and these stories running, and Dave and I just sit back and giggle. Because it is the coolest thing we have ever seen. It has grown adults like, if you're in the last panel and you notice the little the little quick play out afterwards, there are yeah, did, three people in the back. Did anybody notice the three really evil suckers in the back room that were just ex so easy. Easy. <laughs> Yeah. And for those of you guys out on video, I'm sorry. Um, that was the crew of the uh, the, air, the force of this force of Icarus. The farce of the bark of Icarus. <laughs> um, you'll get to see more of them tomorrow. Yeah. They have gone so much into playing this game that once they left that panel, we went looking for them. They just, for all I know, they're sitting in this room. <laughs> I have, we have no clue who they are. If you go online on the Scar, you become a member of the Scar's webpage. There are posters being put up of a certain individual. <laughs> I've been, let's see, I'm Voldemort, behind the scenes. Um, just because you look cool is no excuse for piracy, join the order. Um, Cedric Whitaker is Voldemort, vote for Harry Potter, join the order, and save Harry Potter today. Um, there, for those of you who've seen the picture of me with my skull mask on, it says Cedric Ray Whitaker, the true face of horror, join the order, fight for father. People are building these and posting these. And yes, in my character, I'm like, oh, 
in real life, I would squeal like a four-year-old girl going, get in here, check this, this is <laughs> Okay. And yes, he does swim. Yeah, yes, I do. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. We're now, give you guys some real quick. Or we got an hour and a half. Here's oh, what you're stuck in here. Nobody leaves. <laughs> uh, what was something at eight before the exactly. masquerade? That is at eight o'clock. We're having a, a steampunk group meetup. Just because we say steampunk doesn't mean our brothers and sisters in the blue and purple hair are not invited for the red hair. Uh, there is one picture or the out no there. Hair. Or the no hair. There is one picture out there of me with three foot liberty spikes. That color pink before Mother Nature took over and it all disappeared. Uh, <laughs> beware. Beware of putting almost glue in your hair to get it where you can run into walls with the liberty spikes. <laughs> <laughs> because you will die. It's, 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 it's on. That's not. You got the power. You are the, the, the master control. I am the master control program. Master control. Is it in the lobby though? Yes, yeah, so we'll be down in the lobby. And you guys will get a little bit of an idea of what's going down tomorrow. GDN relaying intercepted transmission from sector 888. Universal code name Skarl. Transmission detected priority one distress. Partial transmission received. Transmission begins. Are you having working yet? Yes, sir. Be sure how far the signal's gonna get. This technology hasn't worked in hundreds of Shut up! <laughs> Do your regular speaker. Okay. Because my phone's about to die, and I'm getting emails. Wow. ADOS. It's nothing. Ooh, shiny. I have to be sure how far the signal's gonna get. This technology hasn't worked in hundreds of years. This is General Bell Landry of the 34th Infantry Division of Skyrim's military. Self-detonation 90%. Probability of destruction of invading force 70%. Probability that invading force was the order. And then data set. Unable to calculate. Locking all access to Skyron and launching ether stream hazard probe. Quantum entanglement door 88 offline permanently. To repeat this message, press zero for all other options. Please press the pound key. <laughs> <laughs> that was done in our shop by that gentleman right there. Yay. Now you have to claim the one for San Japan. Okay, this is for tomorrow. This is for tomorrow, guys. Okay, so you have some idea. You keep saying for tomorrow, but what? Tomorrow? It's <laughs> we can give you some. Okay. Real quick synopsis here's the, the uh, keynote version of what's going on. You have SCAR, South Central Armada of Renegade Steampunk. What it is is a loose, I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> loose conglomeration of a bunch of airships and individual crews from the Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Louisiana. We came together as a, as a Facebook page to share information here. We're going to go see the mo a movie this week in Mobile. Well, that got kind of old, kind of boring, and we wanted to play. So we were, you know, I like a bunch of kids who now have expensive toys. So scars came together and we came up with the order. The order, how many of you have seen this in Chronicles of Red? 
We, I do it. If you haven't watched it tonight. It's on Netflix. Yes. Think tomorrow you will be getting in, you get to be able to see the Necromongers basically yes. showing up um, and Lord Marshall. Um, and the deal is, is the order is supposed to be that in society which we are fighting. It is normalcy. It is non-artistic expression. It is you must work an eight to five, Monday through Friday job, have two and a half kids, have a white picket fence, and become a yuppie from. Mm. That's the order. The order wants you. think religious zealot. Think we will take care of you. We will feed you. The order loves you. This sounds like no. see Germany. <laughs> yeah. uh, the moment I watched no the video that you posted, I was just like, mm, we keep what we kill. That's the first thing that I said. Someday when I grow up, I will be real. Um, but, <laughs> right, shave it with my knives, and I do have set his mind. Uh, but that is the order. The order is that evil entity that wants, wants to tell you that they're there to help, and wants to tell you how to think. Those of us that are old enough to remember 1984 oh, and yeah. um, uh, Animal Farm, and those, you know, those where you will get up, you will go to work, you will come home, you will do exercise. You know, Fahrenheit 451. I'm aging myself. 451. Come on, 451. So I know. Uh, wrinkle in time. Wrinkle in time. That's what we wanted to do. Yeah. What we did with scars. The scars is the resistance. We are the French resistance, basically, from World War II. The captains, we're talking to each other underneath the table, and okay, where are we going to fight? How can we fight? We can't take them on, you know, head on. Blah blah blah. The deal was backing out of the storyline in the real world was we decided, you know what? It was really cool to show up to a convention in our cool steampunk outfit. Ooh, look how sexy I look. <laughs> okay, that's cool. And most of the people, cosplayers, steampunk, spend hours coming up with their characters, doing research, coming up with airship crews, Putting up with airship crew crap. <laughs> Captain, sorry. Uh, you put in all these time and hours to build this character for what? Just to be? So we decided, why not, taking it out from our cosplaying brethren, let's take it out in the hall. So what we did is we started a storyline with scars, with the orders of the bad guys, which was really scary is before the order ever went live, we had only put out rumors that the order existed, there were enemy airships hopping up <laughs> all over the country going, ASI, we love you, but we want to be bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay with you? <laughs> Sweet! Um, and we did. And you guys got to see the only one on one panel, the Icarus crew. Oh, that was cool. Yes. It's really hard for Dave and I to sit here and play Captain okay. Whitaker and Captain Delacruz when they're in the back. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's why. While they're up there and we're in character talking, I was like <laughs> trying to hide the bitter beer face. So. <laughs> awesome! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I had to hide that the whole time, and then that's why I, while they were walking away, I couldn't hold anymore. Okay, guys, out of character, this is freaking awesome. Please stay and make a walk in the So tomorrow, for those of you who are going to be in the area, um, we'll be having a meetup downstairs at 8 o'clock in the main lobby area to kind of talk, because this will be the first time that the Order kicks. Most of us are playing dual characters that the Order characters will be actually getting together in the same location and talking amongst ourselves on how bad we're going to screw with people tomorrow. Um, and the Resistance captains who are not playing Order members are going to be, we're going to just try and get, okay guys, this is what we're going to do, we're not going to kill anybody, nobody's going to hit toss anybody. <laughs> we have actually, and you're about to hear, we're actually issued, how many of the captains and crews in here have their paperwork with them? Whistling, whistling. <laughs> I mean, the there are letters of mark that give, that give you permission and get you to fly into this conference 
under the protection of a multi-verse organization that is saying, okay, Scars, Order, you're gonna play nice. No shooting, this is neutral turf. That's how we're explaining the Order and Scars being in the same place at the same time as this convention. <laughs> and not killing And not, you know, not being having gunfights in, in, the, in the hallway yet. Um, yes, we'll get there. Um, so tomorrow, what you guys will get to see is when we, we got we to decide when, when the Order makes its presence. And I will be, and yeah, this is our, the Captain Hawk Whitaker being nervous as hell, premiering a new set of body armor that nobody except for the guys in my shop have seen, except for Odin, he sent some bits and pieces of it, and he's sworn to secrecy. Um, he's only seen bits, and nobody's seen it together yet. Um, you will get to, you know, there is rumors, we get the character for a second, that the Order is sending flagships and that his, his Royal Highness Higher Marshal Faust will be making a appearance with his high command into the San Japan Conference and will be wanting paperwork to make sure that everything is legal. And those who do not have their paperwork will be placed under arrest and interrogated to find out if they are spying for those evil bastard pirates Whitaker and Delacruz who are not your friends. <laughs> But it's us taking the cosplay LARP role-playing thing and rolling it into the hallways where you have this subterfuge going on. I don't know if you are truly a SCARS member or you're a double agent for the order. You could be hit. Yeah, we're here to support you with SCARS and resistance and walk on the entire time you're getting information from around going to the order and handing over information. It gives you a chance to play those characters that you are an engineer on your crew, you are a medic on your crew, you are a captain of your crew. And it also, the other thing that really brought this up was, okay, you're the captain of a legal airship. Why are you going to be hanging out with me? Because you're my dinner. I want what's in your hole. Wait a minute. <laughs> He's worse than I am. You and I need talk. <laughs> That's how we explain how the lawful airships and pirate crews came together because there was some, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's what we ran with. So tomorrow we're not going to release a whole bunch of secrets. We want everybody to kind of uh, see it transpire as it goes down and let people play it and let them be in their characters. You guys, as the poor citizens of the state of Texas and San Antonio, have a debating force walking into your conference. How do you react? Are you going to support the resistance? Are you going to be actively rebellious and be drugged off to be interrogated by the border? Exactly. Do you, do you openly, are you openly defiant? Now, here's the question that we pose. You got 15 minutes. Here's a question that we want to pose to all of you, and I want you guys to think about this in your cosplay and in your role playing this. Who's truly evil? Is the order evil? Because they're bringing normalcy and order to the, the verse? Or are the air pirates and the resistance truly evil? That's what we wanted when we said, you know, you're over 18, you can play. That's what we wanted. We want you guys, if I'm standing up here as High Air Marshal Faust, and I'm beating on my, my deal telling you that I am here to protect you and fought in honor of Father's love and grace, and we will feed you and we will house you, and we will give you jobs, and you will never ever have to want for anything ever again. You sitting in the audience have to make up your mind. Is what the order is saying true? Or is what I, you know, that those evil pirate Delacruz and Whitaker are attacking, you know, medical supply ships, taking needed medical supplies to the outer rim. Leave us medics alone. Okay. Now, are you going to listen to me? Don't wear the red shirt tomorrow. Are you going to listen to me? When I tell you that those, those airships were carrying weapons of mass destruction and they weren't carrying medical supplies, and we were actually taking refugees off of those worlds, that's the kind of play we wanted to go through. And being captains, and that was, this ties into the Steve Hunt 102 company, you want to be an officer, you poor son. It gives you a chance to play these characters and be put in situations where you have to take care of these people.
aware of your decisions, okay, you make the decision. You're attracted to Constantine. She makes a decision. She kills her crew. Six months of character building and costume building and all that research is gone. She gets to ride home with him, not me. <laughs> But that's what we, and we're, we're working on tabletop versions, blah, 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 so you got you can actually fight fleet against fleet kind of stuff. But we want this interactive world where we, as con goers, be it steampunk, cosplay, whatever, what I want as Captain Whitaker is I want to grab you and I want to pull you into my world, into this steampunk world where airships exist, where Tesla is a god, where, you know, Edison didn't steal all of his new. Or involved Henry Ford in the movie. Yeah, right? <laughs> hey, watch my real last name for it. Um, <laughs> but where all of us can play, and for three days, for three days, you don't remember that you got to figure out how to pay your rent. You don't have to remember that you hate your job. You don't have to remember that Jesus, <sighs> college, this is killing me. I took 32 semester hours and I only should have taken seven. <laughs> you know, for those 72 hours, my goal, Delacruz's goal, the goal of ASI and all of us is to grab you and yank you into our world to where when I'm done with you, when you walk out those front doors of this hotel, you can't stop yourself from just very slowly looking over your shoulder at the top of the hotel because you're convinced that the Isabella is sitting on a stanchion up there and I'm waving at you going, we're jumping, we'll see you next week. <laughs> That's what I want to do with you guys. That's why I want the 101 and the 102 panels is to bring you into this world, have you play with your groups, play with your friends, give you this playground and go, please go play. Be kids again. Period. I'm not a damn airship captain. Don't tell me that. I will growl at you and pistol with you. <laughs> okay. We're doing. We're gonna. Start we're gonna play this. Of, uh, we're gonna play this one for you real quick. I want you guys to listen to all photos. Um, this one is also done by Captain Delacruz. It is called Tomorrow. You will get to meet Dr. Thaddeus Baptiste Vale. Yeah. He will be here tomorrow. For those of you who have not met him, please go out of your way to meet him because you will never, ever, ever forget. About what time is this wonderful scenario starting? We're going to talk about that in the meetup after this panel is over and the meetup downstairs. We're going to figure out what time we want to start messing with all the Skittle kids. Uh, <laughs> so, um, it will probably be an afternoon. Because I'm gonna, need, most of us are gonna need time to disappear. Because the really sweet thing about this, like I told about the posters, I have no clue who those people are. Yeah. <laughs> the Icarus, we have no clue who these people are. I could be telling you, it could have been you guys. I have no clue. We'll play this one last one for you. We got about 10 minutes and we'll take questions from you guys. But it's in the lobby at 8 o'clock. In the lobby at 8 o'clock, we're going to get together, hang out, talk about what's going on tomorrow, and then I know a bunch of people want to get up for the masquerade and follow you guys. Sir. Uh, I got to make a uh, What if they send one of those, let's say that, again, your, your captain, pretty much you just don't get along with your crew, or you're off different to the meeting. Is it one of those that just uh, lay down the law and say, my way, or just democracy? I'm doing what y'all That's a twerking question. That's a twerking territory to get into. Um, there is a fine line when you say, you know what, this is my ship, this is my crew, I'm making this decision, this is what we're going to do. Keeping in mind that you are not a military organization, these people are volunteers, they're going to be like, see ya. Unfortunately, my phone and her phone are out of power, and right when I got to it, it died. You know that phone uh, well, that's on scars? Uh, uh, I have a phone. Yeah, mine's dead too. Wait, uh, wait, what kind of phone do you have? My charger is in the con. She's got a, she's got a cord. She's got a cord on her. She's, oh. Um, but as far as what we're doing with this, we mentioned it in the last panel. Think along the lines of, I'll 
bring up again. I Love Bees, which was a marketing alternate reality game for the release of Halo 2. It sucked people into this world, and they were able to talk and interact with an, an artificial intelligence from the future through payphones. They'd be given a specific GPS coordinate, and it'd lead to a payphone that it, it'd give them a specific time, and it would ring. They'd pick it up, and they could actually talk to the AI. They had to give it passwords and stuff to actually initiate conversation. But, uh, but the deal is, is to give you guys, we planted the seed. We said, hey, let's do this. And then we step back. And all we're doing is playing kind of GM. We're just kind of steering the story and letting y'all have it. Letting you guys run with it. Again, being creative, learning what it's like to play. That's that's what this is all about. That's one of the biggest draws for us in the steampunk world is, is the fact that there are no boundaries on steampunk. Steampunk, yes, there is a base definition of what is steampunk. There's that, you know, goggles are cruise control for cool. Give it, okay? You can't go wrong. I mean, you work out with your cool. But where those boundaries are at, is it selling out if steampunk goes mainstream? No. Being a punk is in here. It's not out there on the street. It's what you are in here. Same thing with steampunk. There are no borders. What you bring to it, what you bring to it, what you bring to it, what you guys bring to it. It just makes it and adds into the steampunk and it changes and morphs and becomes something bigger than all of us. And we can sit back and go, look, we got a community to play. You ready? No, it's so <laughs> The phone died. <laughs> yes, but it's. But it's okay, grab the record. Dude, you got like six minutes. Question. Six minutes. So, we're dressed up in Steampunk tomorrow, there's a possibility that we will be joining the action? Yeah. There's we no possibility. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, you said that? that? I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier. I already spoke to your crew and I haven't heard Someone in the hallway earlier, uh, we're just mundane clothes. We call them mundane. No. He was just wearing street clothes. He said, well, I don't have a Steampunk outfit, but I'm interested in making one. I'm like, you can still participate. This is open-ended. You can be sucked in from this world. Your character can be sucked in from Genesis, what we call this dimension, and get involved in the events. And you can help. Take you guys are coming from an anime dimension that we don't know about. <laughs> Think about it. That's the beauty of what. That's the beauty of what we do, being time jumping, dimensional jumping airships. We bounce all over the bloody place, so it gives us an entire world of play. So just because, you know, this, we can't do this in this world, you know what, in this other dimension, we jump in, everybody's got blue and purple hair. And they all look like cartoon characters. <laughs> okay, and we go about our business. Come on, Dave, you can do it. Don't it's the technology. It. <laughs> it's not steam driven. <laughs> <laughs> then you just have to put in a punch card and you can do it. Now I have everyone staring at me awkwardly like it's my fault. Who's <laughs> <laughs> controlling the phone? <laughs> Sprint. <laughs> I like Sprint though, I've had no problems Kissing their butt's not gonna make it good. <laughs> but have you seen the new phone here from Sprint? <laughs> or three? <laughs> no, I've already signed my soul away too. <laughs>
that same weekend, doing the same exact thing we're doing here, panels and all of that stuff. So at the same time, you would leave you guys, go grab all the stuff from the lake house and move into a storage ship. 36 hours, no sleep, very little food. Captain Whitaker went by plot. We're sitting in Denny's. Table about the length of these two. Full of, you know, the entire crew. And I'm sitting there with my head like this, and I'm watching my pancakes. <laughs> and I ordered a lumberjack. So I ate my eggs and ate my ham, and I was deciding if I was going to give my pancakes a pardon or not. It was sleep, death, just go. <laughs> so the entire crew's talking, and they're chittering and giggling, and the whole nine yards. You guys have seen what a Denny's looks like in late night at a con. <laughs> if you haven't, you will tonight. Um, okay, from my point of view, the pancakes decided that they were going to make a break for the border. <laughs> I was not cool with this because I was still hungry. <laughs> so I reached down, grabbed my fork, came back, and stabbed the pancakes as hard as I could. The pancakes quit moving. Wasn't that about the time that me and Corey were talking about what the gravy looked like? Yeah, you guys had some conversation about the gravy. So when my fork slams into the plate, the entire restaurant goes silent. <laughs> That kind of filters through the sleep deprivation to... Wow, I got quiet in here. <laughs> so I look up, the entire ship is sitting there going... <laughs> in the restaurant. We had to leave because apparently they thought we were on Yeah, they were to call the cops and thought we were drunk, which we weren't, unfortunately. <laughs> so my only response that popped into my head while I'm sitting there, still holding my pancakes, because they'll take off again, <laughs> was... What? <laughs> they moved. <laughs> I grabbed my plate and pulled it over. <laughs> they just started eating the pancakes. <laughs> While the rest of the crew is peeing on themselves. <laughs> and my first thought, so they my wife are going, Cap, it's time to push you to bed. <laughs> well, <I'm not. laughs> it was bad. And they, the manager was threatened to call the police on us because he thought we were drunk. No, we just haven't slept for three minutes. You know, it's funny how many times people think we're on something. Two minutes! <laughs> well, if, if they can't hear this, they can get, get online and hear it. But either way, we have funny stories. Um, <laughs> awesome. One minute. Um, one minute. Clockwork Wonderland. Oh. How many of y'all went to Clockwork Wonderland? There's a lot of people who went. Okay. Roaming Hatter. Apparently, how Toby. many of you guys have seen the Steampunk Mad Hatter? That's him. Not enough. It's a slow clap. <laughs> it just died. <laughs> um, so apparently, Toby, singer Marquee Vaudeville, put on the show, failed to mention to the club owner that I was the official Hatter, the, or the, the fact that I was going to be there and I was going to be in character. He didn't like me. He uh, apparently had gotten complaint that I was serving drinks out of some kind of bomb strapped to my back. <laughs> Underage kids. And that it, it probably contained alcohol. So he proceeded to have me kicked out. <laughs> to which I never break character when I'm doing that. And when I do that, when I do Jack Sparrow, I never break character. So. I'm sitting out there in the, in the middle of the street, moping, crying, kicking the gravel, and then finally, you know, I go up, and the guy at the door is, is like, nah, -uh, you ain't getting it. Maybe it's to me! No, sorry, bud, you ain't getting in. Alright, cool. Um, and finally they get Toby, guys. Thank you, Darby. This is the official adder, and he made the club owner go and give me a hug. <laughs> I'll put this crack on the air. <laughs>